السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته جزاكم الله خيرا for coming today I know it's the summer um, sometimes it's difficult to get out of uh, whatever we're doing in the summer to come to a lecture because many of us are studying even if we're professionals and we're always doing more and more lectures so it's good to come to these events these events are not just meant to be a lecture you will see inshallah there's a lot more to uh, these events than uh, just mere talk uh, inshallah so inshallah today uh, the um, this is the program that uh, we will have uh, So inshallah we will uh, start with the opening uh, right now inshallah we'll have the Quran recitation we'll have then the talk by uh, brother Bassam Abu Nadi then inshallah we'll do a the $50 draw uh, as well as uh, some recognition and closing remark and inshallah then we'll have uh, dinner bi ta'ala so we'll start with the Quran competition uh, sorry with the with the Quran recitation you can imagine what's going on through my mind uh, I was telling Sheikh Zuhair, uh, I'm running on fumes, and he is also running on fumes. So, uh, yeah, so inshallah we'll have Sheikh Isa uh, to deliver the, uh, the Quran recitation. He's the Imam right now of the West Shore Islamic Center. Uh, SubhanAllah, uh, he has memorized the Quran and has taught many people uh, the Quran. Um, he has a bachelor degree in Sharia uh, and in Muslim law. Um, and inshallah, without further ado, Sheikh Isa, uh, if we can have you, inshallah, uh, recite some Quran for us. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم اجعل جمعنا جمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا ولا تجعل فينا ولا معنا شقيا ولا محروما اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أمن هو قانت آناء الليل ساجدا وقائما يحذر الآخرة ويرجو رحمة ربه قل هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون قل هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون إنما يتذكر أولو الألباب قل يا عباد الذين آمنوا اتقوا ربكم للذين أحسنوا في هذه الدنيا حسنة وأرض الله واسعة إنما يوفى الصابرون أجرهم بغير حساب قل إني أمرت أن أعبد الله مخلصا له الدين وأمرت لأن أكون أول المسلمين قل إني أخاف إن عصيت ربي عذاب يوم عظيم قل الله أعبد مخلصا له ديني فاعبدوا ما شئتم من دونه قل إن الخاسرين الذين خسروا أنفسهم وأهليهم يوم القيامة 
ألا ذلك هو الخسران المبين لهم من فوقهم ظلل من النار ومن تحتهم ظلل ذلك ذلك يخوف الله به عباده يا عباد فاتقون والذين يجتنبون كباء والذين اجتنبوا الطاغوت أن يعبدوها وأنابوا إلى الله لهم البشرى فبشر عباد الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه أولئك الذين هداهم الله وأولئك هم أولو الألباب فمن حق عليه كلمة العذاب أفأنت تنقذ من في النار لكن الذين اتقوا ربهم لهم من فوقها غرف مبنية تجري من تحت فيها الأنهار لكن الذين اتقوا ربهم لهم غرف من فوقها غرف مبنية تجري من تحتها الأنهار وعد الله وعد الله لا يخلف الله الميعاد صدق الله العظيم Jazakallah khairan Sheikh Isa. That was a very moving recitation. Very moving recitation. A very hard ayat, subhanAllah. So next, inshallah, we'll have our keynote speaker, who is uh, someone that uh, I respect highly. I have gone to school with him personally. Uh, someone that I've known for many years. Uh, but someone who has gone and has done some fantastic work uh, in the community. Um, Brother Bassam Abu Nadi, uh, he has been an educator, a researcher, and a community activist uh, for over seven years. Um, he works, uh, he wears multiple hats. He has a podcast that's called Preoccupation, not a, a not so brief history of Palestine, but he is also a social studies teacher at Iqra Islamic School on the mainland, uh, and he is the assistant operations manager there. He works at Reclaim, which is in uh, the role that he's leading. He's leading a team right now um, that is working on accurately representing um, the Muslim narrative uh, here in the, um, or the Muslim experience um, here in North America. Uh, he has a BA in political science and a master's in education. And um, as I said, uh, he wears many other hats as well. So inshallah, without further ado, I would like to welcome to the stage. Uh, so Brother Bassam, please. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. I mentioned to Mustafa before, I have like three hours of content here, and he made it very clear, I have 50 minutes, five zero minutes of of talking time. So the presentation that I have here is a history of mass education in the Muslim world. It's past, present, and future. There's a good chance I'm only gonna get through its past. 
I might not get through its present and its future, but we have some networking time and socializing time. So for people who are more interested in the content, you can ask uh, more questions after. One thing that I will quickly mention is that this is a history of the teaching of Muslims and not exactly a history of the teaching of Islam. And I want to make that important distinction because only a small part of this presentation will focus on the teaching of Islam as a subject while the rest of it will focus on the effort in the Muslim world to teach large numbers of Muslims. So to begin, I want to show you a slide here, and I hope you could all see it. I have here 10 or 11 individuals, and honestly this list could have been 40 or 50 people long, but I have here a pretty diverse group. So I have Mustafa Kemal, known later as Ataturk, founder of the Turkish Republic, Azuddin al-Qassam, very important uh, imam, revolutionary, later shaheed in Palestine, uh, Yusuf al-Azma, uh, Yasin al-Hashimi, uh, Kamil al-Qassab, uh, Azza al-Darwaza, Fawzi al-Qawagji, Al-Hajj Amin al-Husseini, Hassan al-Banna, but if you look up, you're going to see a really diverse set of profiles, some ulama, some politicians, some generals, some activists. What do all of the people on this list have in common? Other than the fact that they're all men. Other than that. What do the people on this list have in common? Now, before I say another word, how many of you were here when I spoke about Sultan Abdul Hamid in January? Okay, so if you were here, you should know that I like to ask the audience questions. So if you're not awake yet, please wake up. <laughs> so so you, can make, you can make this more interesting for both of us. If you look at that list right now, I'll give you guys about 30 seconds. What do you think that list of men have in common? Yes? Impactful message. Okay, so they were definitely all public figures, but there is something professionally that every single one of them had in common. Anyone, or from the sister side? Yes? Are they all educators? All of them spent some time in their life as teachers. All of them. Excellent. By the end of this presentation, I hope to be able to successfully articulate to you how it is possible that a group of people with such a diverse background all spent significant portions of their adult lives as teachers. My personal passion is to focus on the unintended outcomes of education. I don't spend a ton of time looking at curriculum as an area of analysis. It is interesting. Uh, it's just other people do that. What I like to look at are kind of the social and political and economic consequences of learning that are often accidental. They're not on purpose. So in the history that I'll be going over today, and after this introduction I promise I'll slow down, the history that I'm going over today will take us from the earliest foundations of mass education in the Islamic world, and if I have enough time, I'll speak a little bit about contemporary Islamic education, the legacies that we have from these past institutions. So my next question then is, why do we go to school at all? Why is it that all of us have been woken up early in the morning, dragged out of bed, and dragged to this slaughterhouse? <laughs> and why do all of us go through this incredibly difficult experience in our lives? Why do we go to school? Yes. To improve uh, society. He says to improve society. Uh, okay, Let, we can start there. And, you know, can, please give me the first answer that comes to mind. When you think, why do you go to school? And all of you, all of us in this room, have at one point asked our parents or asked our teachers this question, why am I here? Why do I need to go through this? What do you guys think? You look like you're still in school. So wh why do you go to school? Why do you think? Why are you putting yourself through this? Look, uh, look I teach grade seven social studies. I could stare at you all day until you say something. So just come on. Wh what's the first answer that comes to mind? Why do you go to school? Learn. To learn and why do you learn? You could learn outside of school. Why do you go to school? Why do you go through this long experience? What's the first answer that comes to mind? Read and write, yes. To do what? Yes. Because our parents forced us. Our parents forced us. Why? To work. There it is. Halas, finally. Why the song and dance, guys? Let's just get, get straight to the answer. And the answer almost always is to work. 
to get a job, right? What's really surprising is that, or at least particularly to young people, is that that's not where the story starts. The first institution of mass learning in the Muslim world, in Islamic history, were the Qutab. And the Qutab were these mishmash of institutions that existed either inside Masajid or adjacent to Masajid all over the Muslim world. And they had almost, for 99% of the people who attended them, they had no relationship to employment. The Qutab taught their students how to read and write, how to recite the Qur'an, different qira'at, some aqidah, uh, in the later iterations of the Kutab, some basic Islamic history, and throughout the entire history of the Kutab, some basic arithmetic. The Kutab existed to improve one's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one's relationship with Islam. 90%, I, I should have prefaced something before I started speaking, my primary interest of research is the Ottoman Mashraq, that is the eastern part of the Ottoman Empire, and specifically, as Mustafa had stated before, the Ottoman history of Palestine. And when you look at the Qutab, and you look at the Ottoman Empire, you realize that 90% of the Ottoman Empire were agrarian people, they were farmers, they were fallahin, they were peasants. The Qutab did not make you a better fallah. The Qutab did not make you a more efficient peasant. You didn't learn better farming techniques. You didn't learn better strategies of irrigation. You learned how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You improved your relationship with Allah. The Qutab did not prepare you for uh, trading and commerce. They didn't do this. And so, what were the Qutab like? Or what was that experience like? Well, the memoirs that exist, and don't take this as a blanket statement, but the memoirs that exist today of people who attended the Qutab in the late 19th century often speak about a pretty miserable experience. Like the students often did not enjoy their time at the Qutab. In fact, if you read the memoirs of uh, Izz al-Darwaza or Fawzi al-Qawagji or Yasin al-Hashmi, all these people that went to the Qutab, they always report experiences of like fear and cruelty and it was a pretty, often a pretty miserable experience, especially with, when compared with their uh, later iterations of their educational journey. So this is something I've wondered about a lot. Why were the Qutab so miserable for these students? And as I mentioned a few moments ago, I teach children. So um, I'm going to be like very candid, but I have to be careful with my words. Um, children are like miserable to teach sometimes. They could be very hard to deal with. And probably the only reason that teachers no longer hit children is because it's illegal. Because if it wasn't illegal, like if it didn't result in going to jail, you'd probably see a lot more of it, because children could be very frustrating. So it turns out that it wasn't just the Qutab where students experienced like very harsh treatment. Um, there is a, a diarist named Wasif Jauhariya, who is a Christian Palestinian, and he wrote that when he went to the Jesuit school, so he went to like a Christian version of the Qutab, um, one of his teachers slapped him so hard he wet himself. Like it was just a very, education was a very different thing at that time. But the main thing that I wanted to focus on here was what they learned at the Qutab. And primarily it was to improve their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The vast majority of Muslimin at that time did not attend these schools because they didn't have to. But they existed. They were funded as awqaf. That means for the most part, the Qutab were not funded by the state. They were funded locally by wealthier people in the community, or sometimes even less wealthy people in the community, as an act of worship. And so that part is really important because the Ottoman Dawla, the state, did not really get intimately involved in what the Qutab taught or how they taught. The curriculum was not standardized, the teaching practices were not standardized, the quality of teaching was not standardized. 
Now, um, it is worth mentioning. Um, ah, no, you know what? Let's move on here. So, things don't usually change in history unless there's a reason for them to change. And so we had this sudden, sudden jump from the Qutab in the early 19th century to an explosion of modern schools, something that all of you would recognize as modern schools in the second half of the 19th century. That means beginning in like the 1830s and really accelerating in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s. And so to understand this, you first have to understand a modern school reflects an attempt by a state to change a population through policy rather than leave that change to chance. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, I am 36 years old and I graduated from high school in 2005. When I was in high school, I graduated in Surrey, when I was in high school, people from the state, from the government, came to our school, to our career and education class, and pitched us the idea of becoming welders and carpenters and steel fabricators. Mustafa, do you like vaguely remember, did you go to high school here? So do you remember this happening? Because there was a huge push in the province of BC in the early 2000s to turn all the young boys into welders and plumbers and steel fabricators because this is where the state felt that all the jobs were going to be. Now, the state could have left this entirely to chance. Maybe we would become welders, maybe not. But education and education policy is the state's attempt to not roll the dice. They want to stack the deck in their favor to get the outcome that they want later. This is the underpinning of modern education. Modern schools, an even more important point of modern education though, is that modern schools are the vessel through which mythologies are consumed and disseminated. How many of you here grew up in Victoria? Hands up. Okay. You grew up in Victoria. How many of you grew up in Canada but outside of BC? Okay, there's a really, really good chance that those who grew up in Victoria and those who grew up in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, whatever, have a really, really, really close, potentially identical idea of what Canada means. These people in the room, when you close your eyes, you imagine Canada, you imagine the same boundaries, you imagine the same flags, you imagine the same borders, you imagine the same institutions, the same prime minister, and that is because standardized education allows for that to be possible. You all attended very similar schools. Well, there are three things that brought about an emergence of modern, what we would call modern education, in the Ottoman Empire. The first was the Greek revolt and the advent of Christian nationalism within the Ottoman borders. Once the Greeks revolted, then came the Serbs, then came the Armenians, then came the Bulgarians. Suddenly, all of the Christian communities in the Ottoman Empire were up in revolt, all exploring new national identities. That is one. Number two, as a result of those revolts, an Ottoman vulnerability being exposed due to those revolts, the Ottoman Empire began to realize they have fallen behind, behind the ball, right? Their rivals are now surpassing them and are able to influence events inside their borders and they're not able to do anything about it. And the third was the arrival of American missionaries to Palestine and Lebanon in 1820. And all three of these events, that Ottoman realization, the Greek revolt, and the arrival of missionaries, all kind of happened at the same time. And as a result, the first learning institutions, other than the Qutab, the first institutions to attempt at mass education within Ottoman boundaries were missionary schools. Missionary schools, for those who are not familiar, are schools that exist for the purpose of converting the local population to Christianity. These are schools that were set up by American, British, French, Russian, German, Austrian, Italian missionaries. 
Now I mentioned this, I, I believe that I talked about this during the Sultan Abdul Hamid lecture and there were so many people that were there last time so I won't mention it uh, in too much detail again. I'll just get right into what those missionary schools actually functioned like. So like I said, they were set up by all these different kinds of missionaries. Their, their stated aim was to convert the local Muslim and Jewish populations but their lowest hanging fruit, their actual target, their real target, were heterodox Christians. The American and British missionaries in particular wanted to convert the Arab and Kurdish and Turkish Christians from Orthodox and Catholic Christianity to Protestant Christianity. Now, whether it was the Christian population or the Muslim population or the Jewish population, the missionary schools largely failed. For those of you who are you know, from the Muslim world who have spent some time living there, you know that Protestantism as a branch of Christianity is not that popular in our countries. Right? The vast majority of Egyptian Christians are still Coptics. The vast majority of Lebanese Christians are still Maronites. So the schools failed to convert the local populations, whether it was cross-sectarian or intersectarian. But what they did succeed in was expanding the influence of Western powers. In that, they were incredibly successful. Now, early on, these schools did not attract many Muslim students. And why do you think that is? And the answer is super obvious. Why do you think that Muslim parents were reluctant to put their kids in missionary schools? Because they don't want their children to get brainwashed and be converted to Christianity. Of course, right? This is very obvious. But these missionary schools offered something the Qutab could not. The missionary schools, in order to entice new students, expanded their curricular horizon, so they were not just teaching the Bible, they were teaching advanced mathematics, they were teaching different types of science, so chemistry, physics, they were teaching biology, they were teaching engineering. These were very advanced schools. And what ended up happening very quickly, in just a few decades, is that the Christians who attended these schools were now getting the best jobs in the Ottoman bureaucracy because they had more skills. So very quickly, the Muslims began to see that if we do not enroll our children in these schools, we are not going to be able to compete in the future. Education now flipped from learning for the purpose of worship to learning for the purpose of employment. One of the most fascinating stories, as far as I'm concerned, uh, one of the most fascinating stories of the missionary schools and the Muslim community is the personal story of one of the first notable Muslims to attend a missionary school, and his name was Yusuf Dhiya al-Khalidi. Yusuf Dhiya al-Khalidi was a major figure in Al-Quds throughout his life. But in his childhood, his father was a alim, his uncles were all, were all ulama. He was expected to become a alim. For those who are not familiar, uh, Al-Quds, Jerusalem, had uh, a group of families known as the A'yan, the notables. And these families all competed for different uh, positions in the Sharia courts. Mufti of Al-Quds, Imam Al-Haram, uh, the chief Qadi of whatever, they competed for these kind of positions. But now, there are new lucrative positions emerging, and the Muslims are not competitive for these positions because they don't have the skills. Yusuf Dhiya Al-Khalidi began his education in the Qutab. But after finishing his Qutab education, he went to a missionary school, and then he went to another missionary school in Malta, and then he ended up teaching in Vienna. So Yusuf Dhiya al-Khalidi was one of the first Muslims in Palestine to attend these missionary schools. How rare was it at that time that a Muslim attend these schools? Yusuf Dhiya al-Khalidi had eight siblings. I think all of them were brothers. He's the only one to have attended a missionary school. The other seven 
just had a classical kutab education. Now what that tells you is, the family of Yusuf Diya al-Khalidi were hedging their bets. They said, maybe this one will end up as a murtad, we don't, we don't know, but we don't want to ruin the other seven. So we're going to send this one and see what happens. And we're not going to risk the lives and the destiny of the other, the other brothers. They were very reluctant to send their son there. But what was the result? In the 1860s, Yusuf Diya al-Khalidi becomes the mayor of Al-Quds. He becomes Qa'am Maqam of Haran. He becomes an Ottoman parliamentarian in the short-lived 1876 parliament. Yusuf Diya al-Khalidi goes on to have an incredible career in Ottoman politics. So what do you think the next generation of Khalidis did? They put their kids in the missionary schools. The proof is in the pudding, right? If, if the result is good, then of course they're going to follow the same suit. Once Yusuf Diya al-Khalidi and Musa Qadim al-Husseini and Raghib al-Nashashibi and all of these notables in Palestine began attending the missionary schools and they did not leave their Islam and they got the jobs that they were after, everyone who could afford it would do it. A really important part of this story is that um, the missionary schools uh, charged tuition. They were not free. So that means that the vast majority of the people who were attending these schools were affluent. There were people who were well-to-do. All right. The terminal destination, that is the final stop in someone's missionary school education, would have been either Roberts College in Istanbul, now known as Bosphorus College, or the American University of Beirut, uh, at that time called the Syrian Protestant College. Now, uh, that brings an important point, and I kind of regret putting this point here, but I'll try to address it anyway. Um, no, you know what, sorry, I'm going to come back to this slide later if I have time. Is that all right, Mustafa? Okay. The Ottomans realized that their population was being swept from underneath them with this proliferation of missionary schools. Think about what I'm describing to you, right? Imagine if in Canada, none of the schools were managed by the Canadian government. Of all of our schools were American schools and British schools and Australian schools. You remember that question that I asked you earlier about who grew up in Victoria and who grew up outside and your recognition of maps and your recognition of boundaries? Do you think that would be possible if a bunch of you went to Russian schools and Swiss schools and Italian schools and Algerian schools and Egyptian schools? You'd all leave with completely different visions of the world. And the Ottoman Empire realized that was what was happening and they needed to throw their hat in the race. They needed to establish institutions that could compete with the missionary schools. In 1856, the Ottoman Empire all but abolished the Sharia. Now, in the question and answer, you can ask me why that is. It came up a little bit in our Q&A last time. But just take me at my word for now that in 1856, the Ottoman Empire basically abolished the Sharia. The Sharia became exclusively the domain of marriage, death, divorce. That was the Sharia now, and inheritance. Other than that, you had civil law. Right, an equal law that was applied to the Christians, the Muslim, the Jew, the Druze, the Alawite, the whoever, one law for all of these populations. A complete change. And with the abolishment of the Sharia, also came an abolishment, not a complete abolishment, but a tightening of the screws upon the Kutab schools. For hundreds of years, the Ottoman Empire did not care what the Kutab taught. And now the Ottoman Empire is closing down Kutab schools and is uh, forcing the Kutab educators to get certified as state certified teachers, something they had never asked for in the past. And what they were attempting to do was to create a modern civil education system. The civil education system that the Ottoman Empire strove to create was to produce a loyal bureaucracy, an Ottoman bureaucracy that was loyal to the Sultan. 
So unlike these missionary schools that were producing fantastic bureaucrats, but whose loyalty was very questionable, the Ottoman Empire wants to create bureaucrats who still believe in the Ottoman project. And if they didn't believe in the Ottoman project, to convince them that the Ottoman project was worth believing in. So they wanted to create bureaucrats who were um, sophisticated, but who spoke, the language, uh, who spoke the language of the Ottoman state and really believed in the uh, validity of the Sultan's role in the empire. Um, the funding scheme for these civil education schools was a mixture of local, that means on like a municipal level, local funding and funding from Istanbul, from the high port. So you had both of these funding schemes coming together at once. But again, these schools also charge tuition. Now in this is a fascinating chicken and egg problem. Who teaches the kids? If the Ottoman Empire does not have an educated class, the Ottoman Empire does not have indigenous teachers who are capable of teaching advanced geometry, advanced engineering, physics, chemistry, uh, modern pedagogies of reading and writing, who's going to teach all these kids? You don't have any teachers. If you bring in a bunch of missionaries to teach in your schools, then what's the difference between allowing the kids to attend the missionary schools or the Ottoman schools? The Ottoman Empire ended up rehiring the ulama who they had just fired from the Kutab schools and hired them in the Ottoman civil academies. The reason being, they could read and write. The standard was not that high. They might not be professional teachers. They were sent to institutions called Dar al-Mu'allimin to improve their teaching standard. And slowly they improved the quality of these civil academies. And yet, the local population did not trust these schools. The vast majority of Muslims still view, viewed the Ottoman civil academies with great suspicion. Keep in mind that in a very short span of time, the Ottoman Empire abolished the Sharia, fired all of the ulama, and now was rehiring them and trying to convince lo the local populations that these schools were not hotbeds of atheism or were not um, missionary schools in disguise. Uh, there are a few interesting stories here, but in the interest of time, I'm actually going to skip them. Uh, the terminal destination here, once somebody attended the Ottoman civil academies, was usually a more advanced school in like a regional capital, and then they would attend a school called the Sultaniya Academy in Istanbul. Uh, there were several of these Sultaniya Academies. One of them was called uh, Galatasaray. Does the name sound familiar to any of you? It's a football club, right? So the football club Galatasaray was originally a, a, an Ottoman civil academy. There was a second stream for Ottoman education. One stream were the civil academies. They wanted to create lawyers, bureaucrats, judges, people who could manage the Ottoman bureaucracy, and engineers, of course. Another stream of Ottoman education were the military academies. And of all of the schools that I've mentioned so far, the missionary schools and the Ottoman civil academies, the, the military academies, known as Harbiya schools, had something special about them. They were tuition free. So what kind of people do you think attended the military schools? If they did not charge tuition, who would attend a school that does not charge tuition? I'm hearing a lot of people say poor people. You know, the sad part is that people who were truly poor could not even sacrifice the time to send their children to a military school. They needed their children to work on their farms. They couldn't sacrifice the labor. So the reality is that the vast majority of the people who attended the military academies were lower middle class. They were not the poorest of the poor, but they were people who 
maybe could sacrifice one or two of their sons to attend one of these schools. Their purpose was to create an army capable of withstanding the constant onslaught the Ottoman Empire was facing. If I list for you the battles that the Ottomans faced between 1856 and like the rise of Sultan Abdul Hamid in the 1870s, your head would spin. It was one katathin, like one catastrophe after another. And they were just getting pummeled in, on every border, from all sides. And so the need was immediate. The need to create military academies, or the, rather the need to create a sophisticated modern military capable of standing up to these forces was, was dire. Uh, the problem is that taking a child and turning them into a, a, a war hero takes a generation. And yet, surprisingly, they committed to that path. And so, to save cost, they could not hire specialized teachers for these schools. So what they did was, they built the military academies. I'll just run you through the basics of these systems. The goal was for every village in the Ottoman Empire to have a military academy. That never happened, but that was the goal. But many villages of 500 families or more did end up having one of these military academies. And if a student was advanced enough, then they would go to a school in the regional capital. And if that student was advanced enough, they would go to the Harbiya Academy in Istanbul, in the imperial capital. And if they were the best of the best of the best of the best, they would go to the staff college. Right. So uh, anyone like, other than my wife, is anyone else from Iraq here? No Iraqis, this is not, in Surrey, everyone would put their hand up. We have a lot of Iraqis. So uh, in the 1920s, almost the entirety of the Iraqi political class were graduates of these military academies. The reality is that the military academies were actually better than the civil academies, even at the things that the civil academies said that it was better at. So the military academies created better engineers, better doctors, uh, better teachers, but they were not allowed to work in the private sector or in the bureaucracy. They had to work in the military. So, in order to cut costs, I went on a little tangent there, in order to cut costs, they built the schools inside military bases, and the graduates of the military academies had to teach at military academies themselves for at least two years. Before you go off to the front lines, before you go off to become a military officer somewhere, you had to do time as a teacher. If we go back to the first slide that I showed you now, and we think back on the likes of Azuddin al Qassam, Mustafa Kemal, Yasin al Hashimi, Musa Kadhim al Husseini, Hassan al Banna, all of these different people, you begin to realize that there were so many different types of education. And so there was a demand for so many different kinds of teachers. Although it was modern education, it had almost no resemblance to how we recognize education here in Canada today. Our education is so much more standardized, whereas Ottoman education was a mishmash of different systems. That doesn't make it better or worse, but it does make it important. As for the military academies, their legacy later on comes from one of their most important accomplishments. One major, one major goal, like I said, was to create, was to create uh, really high quality soldiers. But another major goal was to create what they call a martial spirit. If the civil academies wanted to manage the empire, if the civil academies were trying to produce people who can manage all of the various differences, 
the Kurds and the Arabs and the Turks and the Sunni and the Shia and the Christian and the Druze, if the civil academies were there to manage them, the military academy graduates were not interested in that at all. They were to take that difference, encase it in brass and fire it at the Sultan's enemies. Like that was their job. And the civil and the military academies existed to create a kind of soldier spirit where the nation is a soldier and the soldier is a nation. And you saw that, for anyone who's familiar at least with the Arab world later on, in youth organizations like the Fatuwa and the Steel Shirts. The Fatuwa were, uh, uh, and these were like the Boy Scouts in Iraq and Syria, but they were nothing like the Boy Scouts that you see here. These were really organizations to build a military spirit in young men. And their origins could trace back to these military academies. Now, with the limited time that I have left, I said that I would speak at least a little bit about the teaching of Islam itself. And one thing that you find in the period that I've been discussing, because so far I've only been speaking about the mass education of Muslims, not the way that Islam was taught. Throughout this period in the late 19th century, you had this massive, massive acceleration of Hanafiization of Islamic teaching. The Ottoman Empire was fixated on spreading the Hanafi madhab. Now, I'm not here to introduce like a sectarian division in the room. That's not what I'm about at all. But I want to ask you a critical question. Why do you think the Ottoman Empire was so fixated in spreading the Hanafi madhab? Why that madhab in particular? Prior to this point, in the Ottoman Empire, every city, every city and most villages would have a qadi from your madhab. There was a Shafi'i uh, qadi, there would be a Hanafi, a Hanbali, a Maliki, they were all represented. But the Ottoman Empire went on a massive push to turn the Hanafi madhab into the standard madhab of the Ottoman Empire. Why? This is a bit of a tougher one. I, I'm gonna give like a, a very brief summary of this because it's a fascinating chapter in the history of the, of the Muslim world. This goes back right to the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not even buried yet, but a group of the Ansar have gathered together to appoint one of them as Amir al-Mu'mineen. The Ansar, for the younger people in the audience, are the Sahaba who were indigenous to al Madinah, Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj. The Muhajireen being the ones who came from Mecca. Abu Bakr and Umar, radiallahu anhum, see that this is a catastrophe. I haven't told you why it's a catastrophe yet, but they see this is a big problem. So they go to crash the party. Does anyone know who the Ansar wanted to appoint as Amir al-Mu'mineen? Anyone? Who did the Ansar want to appoint as Amir al-Mu'mineen in their gathering? Anyone? So they wanted to appoint a great Sahabi named Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. If you had it, you should say it. Raise your hand next time. So they wanted to appoint Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. So Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhum go and crash the party. Abu Bakr gets up and speaks. And he, radiallahu an begins to heap praise upon the Ansar. And he says, you supported the Rasulullah when nobody else did, and you protected him when nobody else did, and you are the best among us, and you are the most noble among us, and you are the greatest among us, but, what is his caveat? What is the but? Yes? The Arab will never accept a leader who is not from Quraysh. Al-Khulafa al-Rashidun were all from Quraysh. The Umayyads were from Quraysh. The Abbasids were from Quraysh. And when the Mamalik, and when the Ayyubids, and when the Salajika, when they all ruled, they ruled with the Abbasid figurehead. Until the Ottomans, nobody claimed the mantle of Amir al-Mu'mineen that was not from Quraysh. So the Ottomans knew they had a legitimacy crisis on their hand. Now nobody cared about this when times were good. But now the empire is collapsing from all sides and suddenly people are looking at the Sultan and saying, are you even a legitimate ruler? Like, can you even be Amir al-Mu'mineen? 
The other three madhahib are quite clear that the Khalifa should be from Quraysh. The Hanafis, on the other hand, are quite flexible on this. And so the Ottomans promoted the Hanafi madhab largely to solidify their own rule. Now, there is also a lot to love about the Hanafi madhab, and Imam Abu Hanifa was one of the greatest ulama in the history of Islam. So, I just wanted to share that because it's an interesting part of the story as to why the Hanafi madhab proliferated so profoundly in the late Ottoman era. As for other elements of the teaching of Islam, when you look through late Ottoman curriculum, you find a lot of blending of what we would call modern civic studies, like social studies, with Islamic virtues and values. So you'll find things that are like almost, they're almost funny, they're not bad, but they're kind of comedic, like the virtue of paying taxes the virtue of being a good citizen, the virtue of obeying the Sultan, things like that. And so they are uh, blending together civic studies, again social studies, with Islam. One of the most important elements of this whole story, and I think this is basic, basically where I will wrap up. Throughout the entire late Ottoman period, from the 1850s right until the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, it was normal to travel for your education. If you went to school in your village and you were good at what you do, you're not going to stay in your village for very long. If you're from Deir Zor or Dar'a or something like that, you're going to end up in Damascus. And you're going to go from Damascus to Istanbul. And from Istanbul, you're going to end up being a bureaucrat in Benghazi or Sana'a or Baghdad or somewhere completely different. Think about what that does to somebody's understanding of home. To them, home was among their classmates. Home was not a physical place. Home was a group of people they built incredibly powerful bonds with one another. And when the Ottoman Empire collapsed, these people, the last Ottoman generation to go through this transnational education, became teachers themselves. And the students who attended school at that time in Egypt or Iraq or Lebanon or Syria or Palestine or wherever, were learning from people who were Algerian, Egyptian, Iraqi, they were learning from people from all over. So their understanding too of boundaries and borders also expanded. They were seeing what was possible in the Muslim world right in front of them. They were seeing that their teachers transcended the borders that the colonial powers told them were the borders that they had to stay in. So while there was this new entity called Jordan, in that entity, the teachers were overwhelmingly Iraqi and Syrian and Egyptian and Palestinian. So when the colonial powers attempted to tell these young students that this is your nation state, they were looking at teachers who were literally defying this right in front of them. That transnational character became a defining feature of the early 20th century in the Arab and Muslim world. Now the reason why I wanted to kind of end off on there is because I will make a note about contemporary Islamic education. As Mustafa mentioned, I work at uh, Iqra Islamic School. And I make no secret about the fact that while I believe deeply in Islamic unity, I don't have some secret recipe for how to accomplish that that I'm not sharing with you. If I had it, believe me, that's what I would be talking about, but I don't. But our students who attend an Islamic school, and let this be kind of a goal for the Muslims of Victoria, our students who attend an Islamic school look at teachers who are Palestinian, Pakistani, Fijian, Indian, Bengali, Iraqi, Moroccan, Egyptian, Algerian, converts, all these different groups, all these different nationalities, all represented in front of them. 
And so without us even needing to articulate, to express the importance of Islamic unity, they could actually see it in the makeup of the staff. Just by virtue of the institution existing, similar to what I imagine that the young Muslims in Victoria see in the masjid here that you guys built in Victoria. When they see all of these Muslims together, you don't need to expressly say that the Muslims are one community. The young people who sit in a room like that can actually see it. They can observe it. And that's an important feature of what, of what we've accomplished here. Um, there is one other really important note that I will close off on. If you'll notice in this story, at various junctures in Islamic history, Muslims were very suspicious of education as an institution. In the missionary age, at the dawn of Ottoman education, Muslims were very suspicious. And I would say that over the last 50 years, we mostly lost that. By and large, as a general rule, and the data supports this, Muslims are generally suspicious of authority. Whether it's in Canada or elsewhere. And that's mostly related to trauma that we've experienced in other places, but we're generally suspicious of intelligence agencies, we're generally suspicious of law enforcement, we are even suspicious of tax authorities. Muslims are generally approach authority with some level of suspicion. And yet, for the most part, our parents trusted teachers and schools. For the most part, the Ministry of Education was observed by the Muslim community to be benevolent. Good, good intentioned. They mean well. This is a good ministry. And that is beginning to change. The Ministry of Education in this province is beginning to lose us again. And I think it's good for us to view education with a little bit of suspicion. Parents, you should be suspicious about what your children are learning. You should not take it lying down that your children are doing the right thing and that the school that they go to is benevolent, that they mean well. No, don't take it as a given. You should ask, and you're entitled to ask. You should feel that you are sending off your most valued asset, your children, into these institutions, and we should learn from our ancestors and the mistakes of our ancestors, and we should view these institutions with some level of suspicion. Jazakumallahu uh, khairan for inviting me once again. Uh, if you have any questions, I included my contact information here. You could follow me on Instagram at preoccupationpod. You could email me at bassam at reclaimcan.org. And I will, of course, be around for a question and answer and whatever else. Barakallahu feekum. On time? You're on time. Okay. Allah, 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 Right. Jazakum Allah, 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 um, who liked it? Did anyone like it? No food if you didn't like it. <laughs> okay, inshallah. So, uh, uh, you know, inviting Brother Bassam uh, was uh, actually part of a plan. Uh, inshallah, we're, we're going to have the second annual OBRF conference. Uh, this conference started, um, it was a crazy idea last year. It was the first time we ran it, it was a crazy idea. Um, and subhanAllah, you know, Sheikh Zuhair is always with us, pushing us towards crazier and crazier ideas. But it was a conference that we did across the whole island. So we had, uh, we had five different cities that we delivered uh, presentations at. It was last year. Alhamdulillah, it was, uh, it was received well. Uh, this year, inshallah, it'll be even uh, bigger. And inshallah, it's going to run, as you see from there, uh, from August 31st to September 4th. Uh, some of you have been uh, approached uh, to join the caravan uh, because we take, actually there are more than four s uh, speakers right now, so there are uh, more than that, so this poster needs to be updated. Um, and inshallah, we go across um, the different cities on the island, all the way up to Campbell River, um, and then we 
come down, uh, you know, doing different events, not just talks, but experiences uh, that are meant to um, impact uh, the communities in a positive way. And then we finish with a grand finale here in Victoria. So the grand finale is in Victoria. We have people, last year we had people come with us all the way, you know, from Victoria all the way up. And then they, some people from Campbell River came down with us um, as we came down. Uh, so inshallah, it'll be a great experience. Um, it'll be bigger this time. Uh, and the theme of it is education. Uh, so inshallah, uh, stay tuned for that. Um, and uh, let us know if you would like to help. Um, you know, whether financially or otherwise. Uh, let us know, inshallah. Uh, I just want to note something that uh, we're also running a couple of sports programs. Uh, so we're starting, uh, we have some four to six uh, years old uh, boys soccer. Uh, we find that, you know, they need some help. So this has been running weekly at 10 a.m. Uh, so let me know if you would like to register uh, your children. We also have a tournament, a, you know, a couple of soccer tournaments. Uh, registration right now is, is closed for these, uh, but just that you're aware that we're running some of these programs. There's something um, that must be noted. I will pass, inshallah, on to Sheikh Zuhair. Um, he's going to do a couple of things. He's going to, to do the draw for the $50. Um, and then he's going to recognize a, a family here in Victoria. Um, and it's related to education. So inshallah, I'll let him take this on. Um, and uh, it's important to, to do things like this, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, brother Bassam, for sharing your time and uh, your knowledge with the audience, and Sheikh Mustafa as well, and every uh, volunteer that contributed to this program. Uh, the family that I want to recognize uh, is a family that is about to, to depart from Victoria for the purpose of education. And one thing to, that came to my mind is a story that uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, I wrote about, uh, and this article that I wrote or contributed to was the most viewed, liked, and shared uh, in recent memories uh, locally. Uh, and it is that of uh, the little Hassan. I'm not sure if you had the chance to read this story, if you remember this story, and it was published in uh, some newspapers uh, and magazines. Uh, we could send it, inshallah, uh, through email and we'll post it again, inshallah. Uh, this story uh, is, is part of educating children, right? Part of our effort in educating children and to see something like this happen in our local masjid, local communities, is a reward, right? A reward for us that we are maybe doing something right. So this picture, the, the next picture, is uh, myself and little Hassan here. I don't know if he remembers this or not. He was, I think he was seven. Say again? You should take this again. No, actually the, follow, the, uh, the next picture shows you the difference. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so this was last year, going from being very little to being like way bigger than me. Yeah, this is before and after pictures. So I thought it was interesting to follow up with the children that we work with. So this is the, the family, uh, alhamdulillah, that has contributed so much over more than two decades uh, to the Victoria community. And we want to give them a gesture of recognition. And for the first time, we're gonna give something that uh, we created, that's called the OBRF Award for the first time. And this is how it looks like so that you don't have to uh, 
come all the way here to, to, to look at it. And if there is uh, Sister Amira, maybe, if you want to come forward. I'm going to have, I'm going to have Brother uh, Baba Hassan to uh, give out this gift. Baba Hassan. Baba Hassan is one of the pioneers uh, of, the, uh, of the Muslim community on the island. So we would like to uh, give him the honor to... Uh, There's, there's a lot, there is a lot to say, and there's a lot that I cannot say about the contribution of this family to the community. But one thing that, uh, that's worth mentioning is that people usually who contribute, contribute the most, they speak the least, right? So their actions are much, much, much louder than their words, right? And on the other hand, you will find in the community people who speak the most contribute the least, right? It's very often you find people who complain and talk so much that contribution is very, very little, right? And for this occasion, we, uh, we are happy to uh, take the opportunity to make uh, another, another cake. Different flavor this time. <laughs> With a spelling mistake. So we cannot thank you enough. Uh, the family, Brother Muhammad, Sister Shazana, Sister Amira, Brother Hassan, and little Sister Aisha. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallah, alhamdulik, ashadu an la ilaha illant. Right, so we're at this time. Do you guys know what this time? What is the time right now? $50 gift card. So this is a tradition that we have started and Hamdallah has been working really well. Other organizations are copying this, which is fantastic. It means that we're doing something, right? And it is uh, a draw for $50 gift card for people who arrive on time. So people who arrive on time, you would have had a ticket. You would have had a ticket. Um, and we had someone at the door um, who was giving you the tickets. If you don't have a ticket, just know that you didn't arrive on time. Shame on you. So I'm going to get Brother Bassam, inshallah, to make the draw. Uh, this is an, every time we have a new gift card. So we'll see how uh, this one is called Happy Her. So if, you know, if a lady wins it, you know, she's happy. If a man wins it, you know, someone in his family is happy. Okay, so I'll read uh, the last four digits. One, six, three, six. Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. MashaAllah, that's good. 